My gosh, it's a huge, huge honor to be podcasting my friend and idol and mentor, Dr. David T. Palmer, DDS, all the way from Lufkin, Texas. My God, you have 9,321 posts. We both graduated in 1987. I feel like you're my brother from the same mother. Yeah, I, I wanted to say before we got going too far, Howard, that you are a huge, been a huge inspiration to me and to my practice. And I think partly it was because this is long before Dentaltown, but partly because um, of your 30-day MBA, going to watch you some, and I noticed you were about my same age, and I said, this guy is moving, he's on fire, and it it caused me to get up off my butt and get going, and I really appreciate that. So um, that 30-day MBA got me going. I, I, I actually set it up for my staff to watch, and they thought it was hilarious, most of it too, so Anyway, I really appreciate it. This even before Dentaltown, you were a big inspiration to me. It changed my whole practice, and then Dentaltown came around, and good grief, what a resource! So, well, uh, and what's amazing is, as I did that thirty-day MBA, what I did is, did I ever tell you a story how I have made that? No, no, I, I didn't. I so, didn't know. My, so my, you know, my dad taught me all the business I know, and uh, he had nine Sonic drive-ins. He had five in Wichita, one in Abilene, Kansas, Kearney, Nebraska. Um, Childress, Texas, Louisville, Kentucky. But I always wondered about about 10 years out of school, I said, you know, was, was my old man spot on? I mean, I knew my dental assistant could do uh, a crown and filling, but she didn't have the dental license. I thought, you know, I'm going to go back and get my MBA. So I, I went to uh, ASU. It, there was uh, Mondays and Wednesdays from 6 to 10. It was two classes, two hours each long. Um, it was a uh, trimester, so it was two courses a trimester, so six courses in a year, 12 in two years, got my MBA. And when I was in that MBA, I sat there and I bought my first laptop to be uh, taking notes and all. And I took, uh, I took that notes as applying to a dental office. And then I was implementing it all the way through all the class projects uh, I did on my dental office, like everyone else is picking these sexy companies like Cisco and Dell and intel and microsoft and i was always picking my today's dental office and it was it was tough because when we got to a group project they go well i don't want to do a dental office so you know i was older than them so i said okay well i'll buy all the beer all the pizza i'll, I'll bribe you whatever but it, but so i took notes and when i was done i thought hell i'm just gonna read my notes and it took 30 hours to read all those notes and that's why it was a uh, 30 hour long, 30 day dental MBA, but, but you paid good money for that back then. And thank you so much for that. But, um, over the years, uh, I, I just put it on a uh, YouTube in the video format and iTunes for the sound and it's being downloaded like 4,500 times a month. And I get a lot of emails about how great it was. And I reply back and say, well, that's 20 year old information. And they say, well, if you learned calculus 20 years ago, what, what's the difference between calculus and physics and geometry today than 20 years ago, but they still love it. So if any of you guys are listening to this on iTunes, uh, switch over and subscribe to, uh, uh, what's it under? How do they get to it? It's just called. If they just type in 30 Dental MBA on YouTube or iTunes. Just, just type in 30 Day Dental MBA. But our guest today is David. You, you're, what's the T stand for? You said. Um, Terry. David Terry. Terry Palmer, DDS. He's a member of the American Dental Association, Texas Dental Association, East Texas Dental Society, the American Orthodontic Society, Mid-America Orthodontic Society, American Endodontic Society, the American Association of Functional Orthodontics, and American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. A child of missionary parents, Dr. Palmer grew up in different locations in West Africa before returning to the U.S. to become a dentist. He completed his undergraduate studies at Houston Baptist University and went on to earn his dental degree from the University of Texas Houston branch. Dr. Palmer has advanced training in cosmetic dentistry and orthodontics, allowing him to offer accelerated orthodontic care to both adults and children. He, Dr. Palmer continues the tradition of community service by active participation in youth athletics, both as a coach and league president. He also has taught junior achievement in both Lufkin and Huntington, Texas. Dr. Palmer and his wife, Deborah, have two children, Hunter and Haley. Dr. Palmer is a licensed ship captain and has operated a charter fishing boat company. And he says on his website, it's so funny, the doctor is not responsible for longer appointments caused by discussion of offshore fishing and hunting. That is so cool. How's your boat doing after the hurricane? Because you're down, how far are you from Houston? Okay, well, I'm. We w we used to fish out of Sabine Pass, close to close to Houston. But I sold my boat oh, a few years ago, and I generally fish on other people's boats now. But I had 
I had a long little time in there where I was a captain and, and took people out charter fishing for probably 10 or 15 years uh, in the Gulf. So I've pretty much given that up. I tend to go on other people's boats now, but I haven't given up the fishing. <laughs> That's the old joke. Why would you buy a boat? You just need a friend with a boat. Let your friend buy a boat. All you need to do is that get is a true. case of beer and some hamburgers and show up on his boat. Hey, I want to ask you uh, um, a question about that hurricane. You know, if you go back 100 years, Galveston got wiped out, and the forefathers of that town said, you know, we need to move inland. And the forefathers of Galveston, after a wiped out uh, hurricane, moved all the way up to Houston. Um, do, you th do you think Houston can rebuild in that same spot, knowing that it's just a matter of time, 10, 20, 30 years, and they're going to get the same thing again? Or what, what's, what's your thoughts on, or, or should they all uh, move another hour up the river? I don't really know how where else they could go. And Houston is just so flat. Houston's about 100 miles from here. We have some hills and we can withstand that kind of rain, but it's just brutal down there. I feel sorry for them. It's actually more devastation than than I think that Irma did. It's just that everyone got flooded and it's just terrible to see. But I don't think they can move. I, you know, it's, it's just going to... They'll just have to deal with it. I wonder. I wonder if there'll be new uh, technology in civil engineering where they can rebuild uh, better or somehow prevent that. Because my gosh, what on Dentaltown? There's so many dentists. They lost everything. Oh yeah, it's I got lots of friends down there too from my class that have just got standing water everywhere. And standing water is such a mess. I just feel sorry for them. It's just so much work to tear everything out. You know. My God, it's eight pounds a gallon. I mean, it's one thing to have 100 mile an hour winds, but when eight pound per gallon water starts hitting your house, I mean, it knocks it off the foundation. You know, okay. be, being a uh, being a big fan of your 9,321 posts since 2000, <laughs> I, I'm only asking you questions for the podcast listeners because I already know all your answers because I've been a big fan of yours for 20 years on the boards. Uh, why is it imperative to work on your basic clinical skills and people skills before you all buy all the cool toys out there? Well, I, that's one thing I really wanted to stress on, on this to kind of help out some of the younger dentists in particular, because one of my pet peeves on Dentaltown is to see some young dentist who's very much in debt uh, ask, what do I need to get started? And he immediately is hit by, I think, caring people and people that might have you know, they don't have bad intentions, but they say he needs a CIRAC and they say he needs the latest laser. He needs a cone beam. He needs CBCD, all these different toys. And in reality, that puts this person trying to get started so much more in debt. I think that is common sense flown out the window. And, you know, my recommendation would be, how about we memorize this book, you know, how to win friends and influence people, you know, and then I would follow it, of course, with, the Howard Foran book. Ah, oh, thanks, buddy. Uncomplicated <laughs> business. And you know that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, that was one of the greatest books ever written. I mean, uh, sure. because we're all in the people business. Sure. I, I learned that more from you, too, about that, that we're all in the people business. It's all about people. We're mainly dealing with women. And if you cannot get good rapport with patients, you're just going nowhere. I can assure every dentist out there that you can have the best equipment in the world, but if you are rude to the patient and hurt them, they're going somewhere else. They're going to some other place, to someone who that where the where the staff is nice, the dentist is nice, and he, they don't you don't get hurt. That's to me that's really common sense. But I see a lot of people buying a lot of things that are, I think are unnecessary for for good dentistry. I'm a living example. I have none of that. And I've been in a practice 30 years and you don't have to have every latest toy, but if you want them, make sure you can afford them. Don't just put everything on a, on a note, in my opinion. Yeah. I talked to, uh, I did a podcast with uh, AJ who's, uh, has acquired, bought 19 different dental offices and only two of them had chair side milling and both of them are never used. <laughs> I don't find that surprising. You know, I, I, I know some of the people in dental town think that I'm Mr. Anti-Technology or something, but I, I like technology that you need and works well. I mean, you, you certainly need an intro or camera to show your patients what, what the problem is, but you can buy intro cameras for 150 bucks now. 150 so, bucks? Where the hell do you buy them for 150 bucks? 
eBay, eBay, dairy, dairy you or something, dairy you type. And they work. They're just they're cheap little, you know, everything technology wise keeps going down in price. So you can get interroll cameras, you know, for cheap. Uh, do you know how much I paid for my first intro camera? It was uh, it was the uh, uh, oh my god, Patterson sold it. It was the uh, Fuji Cam. It was right. thirty eight thousand five hundred dollars. And even though a lot of my friends waited three or four years till uh, the price came down to uh, other brands, like uh, for about ten thousand, everyone I know who bought it for thirty thousand didn't regret it because it sold sure. so much dentistry. For those four years, that they would have missed out on two, three, four hundred thousand dollars of dentistry waiting for the price to come down. But now you say you can get sure. them on eBay for a hundred and fifty dollars. One hundred and fifty dollars, and they they work great. Well, I have Eagle Soft, but they work great with I think they come with a little, you know, software thing. It's it's simple, and it, do, so there's do you know no the reason. Brand name of them? Uh, the name or that's is it, it's, it's called Dare You D A D A Y D A R Y Oh, you or something along that line. It's some that, wow, they were great. And, and you know, great. and you know the other, and you know, you, you just like keeping it simple. Like, like when people are always talking about, you know, your um, Yelp reviews and how important it is to get Yelp reviews and buy all this software to help you get Yelp reviews. Hell, I'd rather bet my money on the dentist that can give a painless shot than the guy who has all the Yelp reviews. I mean, there's nothing more amazing than learning how to. I mean, if you're not getting once a day saying. Man, I didn't even feel that. You're good, Doc, and fist bump yours. I'm, I mean, I'd rather be the guy with a painless shot that went read how to win friends and influence people and know how to have a good chairside manner and not talk down and not be condescending. Agree or disagree? No, I absolutely agree. That That is the one thing people are scared to death of. And we, we deal in a whole profession where people are scared to death. And if you can give a painless shot, you got it made. And I, I, I preach that on dental town over and over. And I, I'm amazed that some people still don't try it, but it's very, very simple. A small 30 gauge needle, you warm up Prilocaine plane and you inject very, very slowly as your first injection, just that Prilocaine plane. Then you can follow it slowly with septicane. I like septicane of course, and, and or lidocaine or whatever you want. But if you do it correctly, Everything but the palatal can be completely painless. And, you know, the, the patients absolutely like that. I have patients that tense up and they still don't know you've given them the shot and they're just completely thrilled because they've been hurt somewhere else. And, uh, and you know, don't think they don't go tell everyone because I don't see any patient asking any other question. I don't see other the patient's friends asking any other question than, did it hurt? And it, <laughs> it better not hurt. So, so, so Prilocaine, that's a sit nest, right? Right, right. But the plane, no epi in it, you know? Okay. And, and why, sil why Prilocaine, uh, generic brand name, sit nest, uh, plane, no epinephrine. Why, why that? Well, it, it's really, really close to body pH. I think it's 6.8. And so I think it's, it's way closer than all of the other brands with epi in it in particular. I think Mepivacaine plane might be very close also, but Prilocaine plane and it's warmed up little. We have warmers in every single operatory. So we always get a warmed Prilocaine plane and a 30 gauge needle. And it is very difficult. You cannot feel it at all. If you do have, if you go slow. Okay. But the, the kids in dental school and the young ones are saying, well, you can't use a 30 gauge small. You have to use a, a long, a 27 gauge long. How, right. If they did that in dental school, um, their instructor saying you got to use long. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I don't know. 30 years, 30 years strong. I've used short 30 gauge needles, period. For same everything. Here, same here. Same here. I, but I, I, don't, I don't tell anybody because other people say, well, you can't aspirate. No, I don't see the problem with that either. I, and you, and I mean, the trick is just going very slow. Not, you know, I, I hear people having trouble with septicane or some other problems. I think they're taking a big needle they're jamming it very hard and they're pinning that nerve up against the, the, you know, mandible somewhere and then injecting quickly. That's how you get in trouble. I think going very slowly with a very small needle, you aspirate and go very slow. It's no problem at all. And I, I have very, very few problems with any type of paresthesia. 
You know, I use Septicane for almost everything now. It's such a good, such a good same, local. Here, same here. You and I are twins. Uh, I mean, um, and then the other deal is when you, you keep saying slowly, and what I always say is that, you know, you and the other patient in the chairs both have 99.9999% the same DNA. So you got, so the same press receptor in your thumb. If I'm feeling it in my thumb, they're feeling it in their, in their jaw. It's pressure. There's five types of nerves, hot, cold, movement, pressure, pain. So when I give that injection, I want to try to give that carpule without feeling my thumb pushing on it. Absolutely. And, and I think, I think as many dentists get in a hurry, they just, they want to go ahead and just, and they take lidocaine plain or lidocaine one to a hundred, which is taught in dental school, room temperature, bigger needle, and they inject it quickly. And there's no getting around. That's going to hurt. Yeah. That hurts every time. And I'll tell you what, they leave your office. I mean, I've been there 30 years. They leave your office and they go somewhere else because the insurance or it's closer to work or whatever. And they come back and they tell you for 30 years, Oh my God, I went to this other guy. I thought he was going to kill me. <laughs> it's like, dude, you, I mean, it's just intro 101. You have to give a painless shot. So you're saying the room temperature in an air conditioner dental office is probably 68 to 72 degrees and the body is 98.6. So where do you get these warmers? And you just, how long do you put them in there? How long does it take to warm up to body temp? Or, well, or do you warm them up more than body temp? No, no, no. I think it's, I, th I don't even think it's all the way to body temperature. I don't really know right off. It's just a little square box that you fill. So when you press the button, they'll pop out the bottom. So, and all there is at the bottom is just a little light bulb to warm them. So we have one in every room and right before we give the injection, we just pop that little top, just press it. Out comes a warm cartridge of prilocaine plane. We load it and inject it right then. So, so, they're, I don't, so they're in there all, how many carpules does it hold? Well, maybe 50. And, per, and they're, all, they're in there all day long? Uh-huh. And does the, warm, does the warming speed uh, shorten the, the half-life of it? It probably does, but I haven't noticed a whole lot of problems with it. I mean, it might do it some. So, But all, all, all I'm using that for is just the initial injection. And then I'm following it with something that actually works well. Because the prolocane plane doesn't work very well on its own. Do you... Um, do you um, Put topical on before the injection? I used to, but I quit doing that because I found I could do a painless injection without it. Now, that sounds weird, but even in the anterior, some of these really, you might think, real touchy places with the right technique, small needle, very slow, very carefully with the prilocaine plane, it's painless. It still is painless. Where, where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in Newport News, Virginia, but I was raised in Nigeria and Niger. My parents were missionaries, so it's a, I've had an unusual childhood. Wow. And, and how old were you when you, uh, which one were you in first, Nigeria, then Niger? Right. Nigeria first, and then we were in Niger in the um, early 70s. So how, and, how old were you uh, in Nigeria? Oh, I, since before I could remember up till I was about 12 or 13 years old, I Did, guess. Do you still remember? You still oh yeah, Nigeria. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was I grew up there as a kid. I, I had a great time as a kid. When you're on a kid, you're just along for the ride, you know. It's were fun. you in the capital, Lagos? No, no. We were in Kafanchan and Jos and Kaduna, and uh, there's a bunch of different towns. Generally, towards the middle of Nigeria. And then you moved to Niger. To Where'd you live in Niger? A place called Marathi. It's just right. It's right on the border. Uh, very pretty close to Nigeria. So right from, in the age, desert. from age 13 to what? Probably till I was, see, I think we came back, came back to the United States the last time when I was about 14. So uh, we were only there in Niger for maybe a year and a half, two years. Do you think that was pre um, pretty profound growing up in two other countries? Do you think uh, that made you more worldly and well-rounded? Um, yeah, in fact, it, it made me just so grateful for the United States. I mean, if I know I get on the dental town of the political form. I am just hey, complete in love with the United States because I know what it's like elsewhere and the corruption and the problems they have elsewhere. We don't have nearly that kind of problem. And so it, it makes me uh, makes me glad to go to work every day. I know. I, me and Ryan have lectured in five continents in the last 12 months. And I, oh. you know, when I hear people throwing America under a bridge, I just so wish they had to move to all these other countries, especially the countries that they came from. 
It's like, really? Well, I, why don't you go back? Why don't, because when you, when you lecture five continents uh, in a year, my God, we're like, there's very, very few countries. Uh, very, uh, there's 220 countries and territories and islands, and there's, you could I, count on, on your fingers and toes which ones are worthy of living in. Right. And right. that's and, only and, 20. <laughs> that's probably true. And most of the time, most of the other people that you'll hear them badmouth the U.S., but they all want to get here, it seems like. They all want to be here. So it's – anyway, it, it, I had an interesting childhood. Yeah, that is amazing. So um, now but when you moved back when you were 14, what city did you grow up in? Uh, what, what city did you move back to and grow into? Because I'm, I'm wondering um, how did you end up in Lufkin, and do you think – uh, location and demographics matters uh, to all these young kids that are coming out and listening to you at dental school or right now they're working in corporate dentistry. Uh, how did you end up in Lufkin and do you think demographics and your location matters to your success? Um, I think it's imperative actually. I, we When we moved back we lived in Virginia but then my dad moved down here. My dad took the whole family down uh, in the 70s and we lived in New Caney and which is just outside of Houston. And then I went to school in Houston, but I was glad we moved to Texas. And what I had no one in, in the dental field, so I had no real connections anywhere, no family in the dental field. And it, I think it was kind of an advantage because when I got out of dental school, I had the entire state of Texas to look at. And I wasn't afraid to go to any part of the Texas. And I, I looked at a lot of different practices and the one in Lufkin just seemed to click with me. I clicked really well with the man named Dr. O'Quinn here. And it just it just seemed to click really well. And the price was right. And he was going to retire. And so everything worked out well. But the reason I talk about location on that is I see way too many people piling up in places that are very, very difficult to make a living. And I, I think it's kind of tragic. I think if you, you if too many people pile together then you're fighting PPOs and all kinds of problems. And I don't, I understand why everybody wants to live in Southern California, but not everybody can live there. It's, it's difficult. And so, uh, you know, I, like I tell everyone, I, I can't, I can't see the ocean from my office or from my house, but I can visit any ocean I want to pretty easily just because it's, it's in a, a, a location where, the need is there that it wasn't as difficult to get started. I was able to buy real estate at a reasonable price. Uh, the taxes aren't too high. It, it's just a lot of things in, in, the, in the favor of dentists if they will go out a little bit and just take a look and, and see if they can make, make it in some of the slightly more rural areas, in my opinion. You know, you, the millennials say, I, I don't care. I mean, they come out of UMKC. So they're spoiled to death living in Kansas City with the plaza and Westport and, and the, the basketball teams and the Kansas City Chiefs. And they're like, I, and, and then you show them that the people that are practicing two hours away from Kansas City have no competition, don't have to do Medicaid, PPOs, charge a thousand for a crown and get it. You're signed up for a PPO for 600. And, and uh, gosh, it's such a game changer to go where you're needed. I think so. I think that's that's super important. And I and I talked to some people, even private messages on Dental Town. I talked to one guy who's having really trouble, and I won't tell you where he was from. From, but when it got down to it, I said, and all the problems he was having, I finally said, "Look, you know, you just need to move. You need to consider moving." He says, "Well, no, I can never see myself out of this area." Well, if to me. If you can't ever picture yourself somewhere else, or if you can't, if you're never going to move, you, you've you've got problems sometimes that you cannot overcome. People used to move all the time. People used to move all the time for work, and uh, I don't think dentistry is any different. Oh my God, yeah, and no, no one even lived in the Western Hemisphere till thirty thousand years ago, so we, <laughs> we all came from somewhere. No one, uh, uh, but the bottom line is, yeah, I, I I've had this conversation before, but I'll never forget one guy. Um, he was in a very small town as 5,000 and the big factory closed and people don't realize that in a town of 5,000, even though only a couple hundred voted for that factory, 
that factory paycheck was always keeping the restaurants going and the grocery store going and all this sure. thing. And and he kept telling me what I got to do. And I said, well, you got to leave. I said, you, you got you to move. There, there's nothing there. And Because he, he was telling me all the demographics, everything that's going on. And he said, no, I was born here, dude. I was born here. I, I'm not leaving this town. I'm going to die here. And I said, well, you, you're going to die there economically before you die in physiology <laughs> anatomy. And he said, no, it took him two years and they had to repossession his house before he finally moved. And he ended up moving only like to a town over. I mean, it's only like a 45 minute drive. I mean, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. But yeah, um, t- when t- when time, I tell him, you know, if you're practicing in Syria and you have a chance to move to Texas, would you say, no, I was born in Syria? I mean, you know, there's just some times right. when. You got to get the hell out of town. Um, I want to, they come out of school and um, you do a lot of ortho and they all come out of school. They, they didn't get one ortho class and the ortho, you know, the endodontist will teach these dental students endo, the oral surgeons will teach them extraction, the pediatric dentist will teach them chrome steel crowns, but the orthodontist, they have to have these minimum hours. So they'll teach them craniofacial development. They'll, they'll teach them all this stuff but not anything they can do in their office. What are your thoughts on general dentist and ortho? Oh, I'm a big fan of it. And I try to tell everyone to <clears throat> that general dentist should at least, if they have any interest in it at all, at least do basic orthodontics. And it, it takes some work because it's not taught in school. It takes you out of your comfort zone a little bit to go and take a lot of CE and everything for that, but it is well worth it. And you, you, it, with good trained assistance, it becomes very profitable and you don't have to do them all. And, and I don't think some general dentists understand just how uh, simple some cases are and which ones to take, which ones not to take. And uh, the, the only time I see general dentists get in trouble with ortho is when they tackle things they shouldn't tackle things that are meant for the specialist. I mean, you know, skeletal class three is not something the general dentist really needs to be tackling unless you do it a lot. But my practice now is probably uh, 60% ortho, and it's just simply grown on me. And the main reason is that I, uh, you know, try to tell everyone to, it's, it seemed like every kid needs ortho. Every kid needs ortho. Generally, after a while, every kid's going to probably need their wisdom teeth out, or and then... Uh, but not everybody needs veneers. Not everybody needs implants. I mean, the, the things that are the most needed is what I encourage other dentists to study and get good at. And then I tell the orthodontist that every dentist I know that learns uh, ortho, most of them after, you know, most of them just become a better orthodontic diagnostician and and are and are more passionate about ortho and there's there's give and take to both um you're um in your town uh lufkin texas what's the population it's about uh 35,000 so how many yeah. orthodontists practice there there are I think there's two in one office and one in another so i think three total now are they uh, mad at you that you do ortho well I don't know if they really like me, you know, but I don't think they're terribly mad at me. But what they do know is that the orthodontic cases that I send them are special are special cases. They're ones that require their expertise. And so that's what I see with that specialty is that um, it should be like every other specialty. Now, now some- do they appreciate those referrals? Because some specialists, like like I know endodontists that just hate people that only send them the broken file in a second molar. And <laughs> they, they say, you know, I, I like, you know, most specialists tell me, most all of them will tell me that about 10 to 15 dentists are 80% of all the referrals. And then when they look at that other 20%, uh, they don't really like the general dentist that does all the incisors and bicuspids and initials and all they send them is retreat. Now, do those orthodontists, when you send them, do they like, oh, my God, if this is coming from Dr. Palmer, this has <laughs> got to be a flipping nightmare. And deep down inside, I don't even want the case. Or do they like it? <laughs> no, I think they like it still. And, and I get, you know, letters from them and I talk to them occasionally about the case. But they do know that it's likely to be one that requires their expertise it is it is probably not going to be a class one minor crowding case that those i think that are so 
straightforward that I, I, I promise you after all these years, my assistants could probably do some of them, you know, and do a good job because they've seen it so much as long as it's the right case. Don't get me wrong. There's just some that are that are so straightforward that I think every general dentist should do because it's such a needed thing. There's so many people that need it. So 60 percent of your practice is ortho. Yes. That is yeah, amazing. So so let's start at the beginning. Let's go through the ortho journey. Uh, they're listening to you right now. She says, I just graduated. I didn't learn a thing about ortho. Where, where would you, how would she learn ortho? Um, there's some pretty good courses out there. The one in general, I've, I've, I've probably taken, oh Lord, three, four, 400 hours. I don't know how many of just orthodontics, but yeah, the, the American Orthodontic Society is very good. I thought that was one of the best straightforward courses that, that tell everything and get you going in the right direction, teach you a lot about it. There's some other ones. I learned a lot from other courses too. I learned a lot from Wyatt and Rondo and, you know, even the, the late doc, Dr. Witzig even. But um, in general, I, I, I didn't take the Pacific orthodontic course, but the American orthodontic course is the one that I would recommend. And I don't have any connection to it. To, to which one's that? I don't have any connection to the, uh, uh, American Orthodontic Society, the AOS. Now, is the AOS that's for general dentists that do ortho? Right, right. And who's the uh, who's the Grand Wizard of that group? Uh, it used to be Garrity when I was oh, taking Garrity. It. I'm not sure, yeah, it was Garrity. And then Jackson, Doctor Jackson, took over, and then he passed away, unfortunately. And when did he when did he pass away? Oh, it wasn't long ago. I had just taken a course from his. And we were all the way down in Cabo San Lucas, and I took a course with Dr. Jackson, and he passed away, I think, six months after that. I don't know what was the problem, but, yeah, I was sad to hear that. He's, he's, he's a good instructor. Oh, my God, one of the best. So um, their website is orthodontics.com. I mean, how old of an ortho organization do you have to be to get orthodontics.com? I still gnash my teeth. I started Dental Town in 98. That was that was okay. 19 years ago, and then that, and you were one of the first what 100 to join. Yeah, I was going to tell you about that. That was interesting. When it, when I first joined, there were so few people posting that when 10 people posted on a single thread, a little fire came up. Like this one, this one's on fire. This topic's on fire. And I look back now, and I see threads now that are over a thousand pages. <laughs> Things have grown. You've done a good job with it. But it was funny because back when I started Dental Town, if you had an idea for a, a, a URL name, like these guys decided, well, let's just get orthodontics.com. So it was available. You know, I didn't realize exactly. back then that I should have registered for like a thousand domain names <laughs> because now yeah. in 2017, it is so hard to get a domain name. So orthodontics.com. The American Orthodontic Society, the AOS, is the largest educational association of general and pediatric dentists who have chosen to add orthodontics to their practice. We have proudly provided the finest ADA and AGD recognized orthodontic education programs for over 40 years. That is amazing. And, uh, and that is um, Dr. Chris Baker, Joseph Smidbauer, Leonard Capriza, Bradford Williams, Jay Gerber, William Wyatt. And William Wyatt's son is all over Denham Town. Oh, that's you great. Do you know who his son is? No, I don't. I didn't Willie. Know his, Willie. Oh, that's Willie. Okay, I know Willie. Okay, that that's right. That's right. I know. He, I remember he mentioned that. And you know what? And uh, his dad was one of the most famous orthodontists. And every time I talk to Willie, I'm always telling him, I'm saying, your dad's life work is on celluloid film and 35 millimeter PowerPoint slides and digital. <laughs> It is your mission to digitize all that um, because, Correct. I mean, that guy's lifelong work. There's so like, like Bob Barkley. I mean, all of right. his work, uh, LD Pinky, all of their work. And these kids come out of school and, you know, the books, you know, unless they got the book, you know, there's something great to be said about digitizing yourself uh, in a YouTube video, uh, um, you know, or, or something, these pod, I've already got, we've already got two podcasts that we did with legends that are no longer here. Um, um, uh, who's the founder of Den Mad, Bob Ibsen, uh, wow. Carl Mish, uh, you know, like, oh, yeah. so, I mean, uh, it, it's, just, I felt so good. The only consoling thing I thought when Carl Mish passed away was at least 
a hundred years from now, there'll be a two and a half hour interview with them on this uh, podcast talking about everything from A to Z because these guys were just legends. So you recommend that uh, if someone's listening to this and they want to uh, get more in ortho, that they should join the AA, the AOS, the American Orthodox Society? Um, yeah, I think that's probably the, the best one course. Now, I'm, I'm not recommending one course in particular. I suggest they take a lot of them because you learn something from everyone. And, and I really delved into that very hard. I don't suggest starting orthodontics without really working at it. And like everything else, I think you should jump in with both feet. It's, it's hard to, to do it unless you kind of have a bigger picture. But I will tell you that the Bob Garrity really impressed me when I took it from him. He had some of the nicest finish work I had ever seen. And he also had a particular appliance that I'm not sure why everybody doesn't use it. But it is is a, a distalizing appliance called an MDA. It's kind of a modified Wilson, and it is the most impressive thing on what he could do with that. And by watching his work and and the progress of his work, it was the most eye opening course that I've taken. And I immediately applied a lot of that those principles in there, and it's it's been been wonderful. So his website is orthodonticteaching.com, the Garrity Orthodontic Seminars, orthodonticteaching.com. And uh, so you're recommending that one? Uh, I guess I haven't really looked at that particular one. I just remember when I was there and he was teaching the course, just looking at all of his cases were fantastic. And things that I didn't think would be possible, things where it seemed like a for sure extraction type case, and he would simply make it work without it. It was wonderful. I mean, it, the man knew what he was doing. Yeah, and uh, and all those guys, they didn't like the extraction. And the, the reason with that is um, when I got out of school, I mean, it was just so, um, there were just so many, um, there were so many orthodontics that basically do just pull all on four. I, I remember some of these cases in 1987 where, my gosh, they, uh, um, they, they, it was a minor crowding case. And most of the right. time, most of the time of the orthodontic treatment was just taking a millimeter a month, pulling back to cover that extracted space. And, uh, right. so, so then, so then the pendulum, uh, starts swinging. And I would say back then half the cases 30 years ago were four by cuspid extraction. And now I'd say it's 20%. So probably 30% sure. of those cases went away. Right, right. And another and I, one, the, the, the one I recommend is um, Richard Litt because most orthodontists won't teach general dentists, but Richard Litt is the only board certified orthodontist. Uh, oh, and, and Skip, uh, what, what's uh, Skip uh, um, Tip Edge? The, the Harry, Harry Green. Oh, yeah. Harry Green with Tip Edge. And right. Richard Litt of FORCE, which stands for FORCE, Faculty Orthodontic Research. Uh, something, something, um, these are the only two board certified orthodontists who will actually teach a slow life general dentist. And Richard Litt was the, uh, pro orthodontic specialty program chair at university of California, San Francisco for years. Then he went over to uh, Detroit, Michigan. So at least if, if you're wondering, say, well, I only want to be taught ortho by a board certified orthodontist. There's two choices for you. Um, Harry Green. Um, what about Invisalign? What percent of your ortho is Invisalign? I just don't do it. I, I started to do it at one time, and I I couldn't get a good finish. You know, it always seemed like I had to put a few little brackets to get the last little bit of tip and torque. So I don't know if – I just don't have the skill in it. I've seen some uh, some great work on Dentaltown. Uh, David Harnick is unbelievable with, with Invisalign. Yes, yes. I'm going to go visit him. My, my sister lives there, and I told him I'm going to drop in on him. He is – he is my, uh, you know, orthodontic hero. He is really good. And he posts on Dental Town with us little guys. Yes, yes. he is and, and so amazing. He, he he teaches he teaches us. I mean, all the other specialties do it routinely, but very few orthodontists will mingle with uh, us. And uh, he he's an amazing man. And my best friend at dental school, um, Craig Steichen, is in Albuquerque too. Albuquerque's got some right. big shout out to Albuquerque. Or you know what you should do? You should charter a fishing boat. <laughs> and boat from Houston to Costa Rica, where the Invisalign factory is. And uh, then, oh. <laughs> you, you, you should deep sea fish all the way to the Invisalign factory. <laughs> <laughs> 
that would be fun. <laughs> so another thing you do, um, you the the, the ne- you do molar endo and wisdom teeth. And when I go into these uh, dental schools, they haven't even graduated yet. And half the class tells you, I hate molar endo. What would you say to a kid that's coming out of town, coming out of school, and she, she's got $350,000 student loans and she already hates endo? Um, it's one of those things. I, like I said, I, I think it's common sense that you do what is the most needed. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people that need molar endo. And if you just pass on all of it, you're just passing on everything. It, it, if you, I think people that hate, sometimes hate things, they're simply a little out of their comfort zone. They haven't done it enough. And if they do it more and more, sheer repetition alone will in, improve their speed and their confidence. And before long, molar endo, you know, it's never easy, but it's a whole lot easier than it used to be. And I, I mean, if you cannot, one of the things that I think kind of freaks some people out that I tell them is that I literally, I learned this from you, the capacity thing. I have enough chairs and well, just today I had someone come in and is, is he had number 18 was just killing him a big hole in it. We worked in an entire root canal and a buildup and a crown around everyone else. Now it wasn't, it wasn't easy to do. But it's something that if you work on your molar endo, if you work on these kind of things and get them down to where you can do it quickly, um, you probably remember that time we went to Scott Perkins' place, and I learned a lot from him. Just efficiency techniques. If you can, it was you, me, and Jerome Smith were there. Yes, and uh, God, how many years ago was that? Stephen Glass was there. Oh, that's right, another Texan. You bet. You bet. Where's Stephen at? Uh, Stevens in, in Houston, I think he's, I want to say spring, but I'm not sure. I think he's around spring area. Did he get hit by the hurricane? Uh, yeah, but not too bad. I think he's, he's okay. I don't think he, it flooded anything God, for him. I, love, I love all those guys, Jerome Smith, Stephen Glass. Um, you, you talked to Scott Perkins lately? I haven't, I haven't, but, uh, Jerome Smith is another big hero of mine. He, he is unbelievably skilled and his, his implants are just, I mean, I learned more from him from implants than any course I've ever taken. And you know what's so damn cool about Jerome Smith? I mean, I can't even say this without getting verklempt. Right. When he does those over-the-shoulder, hands-on implant courses, he just right. does it because he fell in love with all these people in dental town. He wants to give them an over-the-shoulder program. But you know what he does with 100% of all the tuition money? What does he do? He donates it to support a dental office charity down there in Antioch, Mexico. You know, I that doesn't surprise me knowing him. I that mean, my me. God. That is fantastic. He, I yeah. mean, he just he just wanted to teach. He wants to help all these people he talks to in dental town. And then he thought, you know what? This is I'm doing. You know, I'm I'm just going to take all the toys out of my money. So uh, he just amazing. Uh, but wow. what year did uh, Jerome Smith and Stephen Glass and you and what? When did we all go see Scott Perkins? <laughs> You know, I don't remember, but I, it wasn't even an official CE. It wasn't, you know, no one got any know. credit for it. We I just know. did it. But know? I got to, I got to tell you these young kids because the, 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 that story. So this, it, what would you guess? I mean, if you had to guess what year this is, twenty seventeen. What would you guess? <sighs> Mid nineties, late nineties, somewhere in there. I was thinking like ninety eight, maybe. Probably two thousand. You think it was before two thousand? Uh, I think so. Maybe, maybe before so 2000. So this guy actually ends up getting me in more trouble than any dentist uh, ever did. <laughs> um, he wrote an article, which I love because I know I'm not on the boards and no one got it. It's called the 15 right. minute root canal. Right. So I had all these endodontists sending me all these letters. Oh my God. Dental town is just a garbage site. They're telling these dentists they can do a molar root canal in 15 minutes. Like, dude, you didn't even read the article and you didn't even meet right. Scott Perkins. But I mean, this, it was, a uh, operations and logistics symphony like like you take a dentist they'll use rotary and they'll go down there say, say they do top down or bottom up it don't matter say, say they can start at the bottom of the 15 and uh and then they they're done then they have to take out the file then they change it and they put it in the napkin then they get the next file and they load it and scott's timing that and he's like well dude you just spent two minutes doing that so he set up like four uh, slow speed engine driven. So, you know, when he walked in the room and started doing the endo, the, the 15, the 20, the 25, the 30, the 35, that was all laid out. The, when the guy sat down, he looked at that molar 
in a rubber dam with his loops on, and he never took his eye off the tooth, and he had two assistants, and he basically did exactly what every endodontist does in an hour, but his operations and logistics was so absolutely perfect, it would only take him 15 minutes. Absolutely. And, and I, we I think saw he called- it with our own eyes, didn't we? Right. I mean, how do you argue with a video? He has a video of that, and it's it's very well done. And I'm thinking all it is just it, if you don't see it, you can't think it can be done. But he was he is an efficiency genius from his crown to that. He was just an efficiency genius. That's what he excelled at. And I told him he needed to find a. I asked him if he could do an efficiency on uh, posterior composites, and he said, "No, no, that, that's too many steps and too many places. I got to stop." That's a hard one for him, but he is, he is really something. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, these people, come, I, I read a stat the other day that on Facebook, when someone shares a news story, it's like, well, right. over half the time, they never even opened the story. So they just read the headline and shared it. And like he said, with Scott Perkins, he's ended on us writing some of the most hateful letters in the world. And they didn't even read the article or see the video. And there's not one right. endodontist, there's 4,000 endodontists in America, and there's not one of them that is efficient as Scott Perkins. And no, you know, I, I think sometimes um, some of the specialists underestimate people like Scott Perkins and others who really get focused. And he, you know, he gets his tooth out on a little vice and he sits there and works on it. He puts, checks it with hot bleach. He's doing research and working every day on stuff that they are not working on and eventually he can get to where he can master something and, and I, I just don't think he gets a lot of credit and I, I felt kind of bad that he, he did catch a lot of heat for that I know he didn't take it too well sometimes well you know the bottom line is if no one ever criticizes you you're not a pioneer I mean uh, if, sure. you, if you're really a pioneer you got some arrows in your back and if you don't have any arrows in your back you're not a pioneer because whenever you do okay. anything new uh, someone's not going to like it and Scott, I mean, Thomas Edison failed 10,000 attempts at a light bulb. And what I love the most about Scott um, is that um, Perkins is that uh, his intellectual curiosity about dentistry is insatiable. And he's not going to yeah. sit there and wait till the ADA convention to go see what some speaker tells him to do. He's sitting there staying up till midnight doing it himself on extracted teeth on a bench. And I just love his passion for all things operational logistics. And you know what he reminds me of? I mean, look at the McDonald's brothers. Before McDonald, before Richard McDonald, out there in right. Southern California, out there in Downey, uh, California, 100% of all the restaurants in America took one hour to sell you a hamburger, fry, and a Coke. You go in there, you had to wait to be seated. And then when you're seated, some waitress come take your drinks. And then, and then when they brought you your drinks, then they, they take your order, hamburger, fry. Then they go give it to the, the cook, and then she'd bring, the, and then when he rings the bell, they'd bring a basket with a hamburger and fry. That was 45 minutes after the hour. So now you're down to 15 minutes. And so you eat it for five minutes, and then you're done, and then you get up and you leave. And it took an hour. And the McDonald's, Richard McDonald's, looked at that process and he said, You know what? It should not take longer than three minutes. And it was because we're going to leave the grill on and we're going to put the grill here. Why, are, why, you know, just every, he eliminated all the waste, and the waste was. 57 minutes out of an hour and these <laughs> no endodontists <laughs> wouldn't even listen to scott taking just 45 minutes out of an hour i mean the mcdonald's brothers took 57 minutes out of the hour and and and, and, and you know and and furthermore if you're patient centered if you needed a, a root canal would you rather be in the chair for an hour and a half or one minute Yes, I'd take, I'd take 30 seconds if it could be done. <laughs> I know. And, it's, and, and there's so many self-limiting beliefs. And one of them in dentistry is that uh, if you go fast, you're sloppy. And if you really are meticulous like a Rolex watch, it's going to take 40 days and 40 nights to do a filling. And I just don't see evidence of that. I mean, there are fast, sloppy dentists, but they're just sloppy. But there are right. fast, meticulous dentists who got religion on operational logistics and do everything easier, faster, higher quality, lower in cost. I, I tend to think that's more the case, too, because I kind of liken it to the heart surgeon. You want to see the heart surgeon that does 20 a day, not one every six months. The one that the guy that does 20 a day is so fast and so efficient. He's done it so many times that he's going to do a great job 
compared to the person that does it every once in a while. So I just remind people when they're in, you know, if you're in dental school, it took, how long did it take for you to do your first filling versus now or your first crown versus now? And is it better? And are you going faster? And is it better? So everyone gets, you know, sheer repetition is, <laughs> is, a, is quite a, quite a uh, teacher itself. Yeah, it's the same thing with the dental lab. You want to pay a dental lab $120 and seat every crown in three minutes, or do you want to pay $80 and spend half an hour adjusting it? They just don't know their cost. You know, the right. quality of a crown, I mean, come on, it's just margins and contacts and occlusion. I mean, you don't need a Ouija board to figure out your crown and bridge lab. I mean, right. is the margin there? And most of the margin has to do with, did you give them a good impression or not? Are the contacts there? Are the occlusion there? But I'm looking for the lab, not based on price, but the one I don't have to adjust. Um, and Yeah. It just, <laughs> my gosh. Um, so uh, go on to oral surgery. There's just so many people that come out of dental school and they go, I just want to be a cosmetic dentist and do bleaching, bonding, and veneers because I don't like blood and I don't like oral surgery. And, you know. And what, what, what do you, why, how did you get into wisdom teeth? Where did you learn that? Did they actually teach you that in dental school? Uh, not really. You know, in general, wisdom teeth were taught. I mean, we're done by the oral surgeon there. And you got to observe, but you rarely got to do anything, of course. But um, I'll tell you that one of the things that helped me the most, I think it was actually a video. Um, it was the Productive Dentist series. Bruce Baird. Is that what it is? It might, it might not know. It was a couple of Canadian. It was a couple of Canadian guys, and I don't remember. It was called the. Uh, I just watched. It was a videotape of it. Plus, it was also you know there's good CE. That oh, you can that's right. The productive. Uh, what was it called? The, the productive. Dentist uh, Academy, uh, Canada. Yeah, that guy came stay in okay. my house. Um, right. Literally, his wisdom tooth part in there was incredible, and it was so helpful on just figuring out what to do and what not to do. And uh, you just taking a, a videotape and watching it over and over, um, and then kind of getting a little out of your comfort zone. The, the ones you you got to know what you're doing. You got to have the right equipment. It's not Productive then, Dentist so, Academy. That's Bruce Beard in Texas. Okay, um, I'm trying to. Um, it was a couple of Canadian guys though that were that that were got that together. Yeah. They, they had other videos too. Some of some on uh, endodontics. Some on. Uh, do you remember? Uh, his, do you remember that name, or do you got anything in your office that had that deal? Or uh, no, I sorry, I, I don't. I wasn't. I wasn't ready for that. Was um, it the productive dentist? Probably so. It, it, it sound that sounds like the right one, but it wasn't. I don't think it was. It wasn't Bruce Baird. I know him. It wasn't him, but it was just uh, a couple of. Yeah, it was just two Canadian dentists. Of course, they always say freeze instead of it froze it instead of it getting it numb. So was oh, I just found it. It was John Lyons. Okay, the president of Productive Dental Videos. I wonder how he's there, doing. Okay, can I can I tell you uh, my uh, um, funny story about that guy? Sure. So he calls me up, and uh, this is way back in the day because I was on uh, the last house uh, when I lived on the uh, golf course. And mm -hmm. this Canadian comes up and he says he wants to meet me. And, and uh, he's asked the name of the hotel. And I said, well, A, you can stay at my house, but here's the hotel. Uh, the Arizona Grand is the nicest resort, which is about uh, 1.0 miles from my dental offices. He goes, are you serious? You let me stay at your house? And I go, yeah, but on that note, I got four baby boys. I think at the time they were like <laughs> one, three, five, and nine. I said, uh, you know, you might get uh, hit over the head with a baseball bat and uh, a black eye because they were just completely crazy. And he goes, nah, no problem. So he comes to the house, but it was in the middle of winter. He did it over Christmas break. And we yeah. had a swimming pool. And, and in Phoenix, you know who was born in Phoenix because during the winter, they wear a jacket and a hat. And you always know who the snowbirds are because they're out there walking around town in shorts and flip flops. And you're looking at these people like, <laughs> are these people out of their freaking mind? So right. he comes to nobody in Arizona ever swims in December in an unheated pool. And that guy right. goes, oh, my God, a swimming pool. I want to go swim. I go, no, 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 no. It's not heated. He goes, I don't give a shit if it's heated. He goes, it's 68 degrees out. That That's warm. I'm like, no, dude, we're. 
this is winter and you can't jump in that pool. He goes out there and dives in the pool and he swung around. So finally, I think to myself, okay, this is all in your head. It's all in your mind. The pool's not cold. Look at Dr. John Lyons. He doesn't have a problem. Put on your big boy pants. So I said, okay, I'm going to dive in there. I almost died. Oh, my God. I mean, I almost completely <laughs> died. And when I came out, my teeth were chattering like rocks while he's while he's laying out. And then he, then he wanted some sun. He goes, I want to go back to Canada with a suntan. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like man, there is something about conditioning uh, to, to temperature. But anyway, love that guy. But but back yeah. to the, the um, how do you learn how to pull his teeth? Does he still sell those videos? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I just remember that was one of the main things that I was learning. Plus, now, I will say, too, I had a, an older dentist when I started, and he was very good at oral surgery. And so he was kind of, it was helpful. He was backing me up. He would encourage me to do some things that put me out of my comfort zone, but he was still looking over my shoulder in case I got in trouble. And that was very, very helpful. That was a, an older dentist, Dr. O'Quinn, and he, he retired shortly after that. But he told me stories when he first moved to Lufkin, there were no oral surgeons anywhere around. So there was no one to refer to. So he had to tackle most of them himself. And he was very well self-taught. But uh, he taught me a lot, and then that that video series, and just and then just slowly getting ones a little bit more difficult until you uh, can easily figure out which ones to tackle, which ones not to. Because that's another one. That's uh, another common sense thing. Everybody's going to need that one day. Most kids need their wisdom teeth out. It's it's rare for everyone to have perfect wisdom teeth to come in. So that's such a needed thing that that is needed far more than say veneers or implants or something that is if you learn how to do wisdom teeth and do them well then you're going to have a natural flow of patients that come through your office as they grow that need their wisdom teeth out so and the reason i love wisdom teeth a thousand times more than i love ortho is because wisdom teeth is instant gratification yes either get them out or not an ortho case could be a year or two and, uh, and the other thing is um, you hate everything in life that you're not good at. Like you don't see me uh, going out uh, and trying to be a singer because I know I can't sing. And it's not people's opinion that I'm not a good right. singer. It's biological <laughs> because when my boys were little, they were like one year old. And I'd be rocking them to sleep and I would sing to them. One of the first words they learn is to reach up with their hand, put it on my mouth and say, daddy, no. I thought, damn, if a one-year-old knows you suck at singing, this isn't somebody's opinion or preference. You just, but, but So the first wisdom do takes you an hour. Well, maybe the next one takes you 55 minutes. But after you do 100 anything, whether it be molar endo and visiline, after 100 and you're maintaining a rep repetition of one unit per week, if you're not doing it once a week, Get out of right. it because you're not going to get good at it. That's the bare True. minimum in profitability and excellence. Furthermore, I wouldn't want to go to a doctor and get a vasectomy if he only did it once every other month. I mean, I'd want to go to the guy uh, that does the most of them. Um, you also um, talk about dental implants. So, some people are telling these uh, dentists that they all got to learn how to place implants. And you're saying, uh, hold on, not everybody should be placing implants. What's your thoughts on that? Um, I think I think it's exactly what you're talking about that doing something once a week you can you can start to become proficient at it but there's such a small number of implant cases and people willing to do implants that if every single general dentist decides to do implants there simply is not going to be enough to do and so I mean I geared up did some implants and I like I said I learned most of it from Jerome Smith and the problem I found with it is that I do so few of them that I cannot make myself comfortable and proficient with it. So I pretty much slowed that down to where I do maybe a slam dunk implant every once in a while. But I, I just don't think it's I don't think it's profitable. I think it's one of those things that one general dentist can do in a group. And if people will refer to him. The oral surgeon can certainly do them, periodontist and stuff. But if you have every single general dentist trying to do all implants, you'll find out there's not that number of patients available for that. It's expensive and there's no insurance generally. So, uh, you know, I, I've always said that, you know, Bubba that has his tooth out for 20 years is not interested 
and getting it when implant in there, but he'll certainly pay for his daughter to have braces. He'll certainly pay for his daughter to have the wisdom teeth out. Those two things are, are common as dirt, but implant procedures are not. One of America's greatest cardiovascular surgeons of all time was down there in Texas, Dr. Michael DeBakey. Uh, oh, yeah. And, uh, and down in Baylor, and he was about the greatest. And his grandson uh, was on my floor, in, uh, I was on the same floor with him, ninth floor of Swanson uh, from 880, 81, 82, I think 83. And uh, his name was Joseph DeBakey. And we used to talk about his grandpa. And uh, I said, well, wh- why do you think it was him? And he said, well, the, the usual stuff, the, the intellectual curiosity, all that stuff. But he said, dude, those surgeries back then with their equipment took six hours to do a bypass. And wow. he did three a day, seven days a week. He did one from six to noon, noon from one to six, and one six p.m. to midnight. Then he'd go home and sleep six hours. And in his surgery room, they didn't have all the equipment back then that you could buy from Patterson and Shine and Benko and Burkhardt for all this stuff. He had his own sewing machine in the surgery, sewing up these pads. And the, I mean, they talk about a Thomas Edison, but I mean, this guy was doing 21 bypasses a week, year after year, decade after decade. That's how you become the number one cardiovascular surgeon of all time in America. And, uh, and I mean, he had some of the most famous people in the world uh, flying all over uh, to have him do the heart. So then that, how, what am I, what does that apply to you? So now you're trying to get into sleep apnea and you're doing one case a month. Would you rather go to the sleep apnea guy that's doing three cases a day or once a month? So, you know, in 1900, there were no specialties and doctor did everything from your head to your toes. And the trajectory since that is broken up medicine into 58 specialties, dentistry into nine. And you got to get repetition, repetition, repetition. And if you're coming out of school and you say, I'm going to master endo and oral surgery and implants and bone grafting and Invisalign and bleaching and bonding and be a cosmetic. And and if you're going to be everything, you're basically going to be a 1900 dentist. So you can't master everything. And when a lot of people are saying they want to add this, I always say, well, what are you going to subtract? You know, (laughs) I mean, you know how hard it is to keep up on implantology. Oh, I, I just find it almost impossible. I get, I get tired of all the different, you know, choices there are per se, just on, just on a single implant. And so, then sleep apnea. I mean, that uh, alone. I mean, I already, I already, I've already podcasted three different dentists that, and, and when they realized how complicated it was and how intense it was, they decided that they were only going to do that. And they dropped all the clinical fillings, crowns, x-rays, everything. And they only do, wow. they only do sleep apnea and they're not in rich places. I mean, these dudes are in Tennessee and Kentucky and, uh, I mean, th- these aren't in, uh, this ain't Beverly Hill stuff. This is real world industry, but I'm just saying that there's so much information out there moving at a speed like we've never seen before. Uh, you're not going to master everything. You're not going to be a Jack of all trades doctor that, that that's uh, come and gone. I, I, I think you're right. And, and you, you know, whatever you're interested in, I, the only thing I think you should try to master or try to get good at are the things that are the most commonly needed. And if, if, you know, if the dentist coming out of school will simply get the best, uh, get really work hard at trying to get the things that are most commonly needed, it'll, uh, it'll help them a lot. You credit me with uh, teaching you capacity. Um, how did, what did I say about capacity that changed your practice? Well, I was in another smaller office and the hygienist had two rooms and, and uh, I had two rooms and it was so stressful because there was always, it was always hard to have an open room. It's always hard to, to work someone in to have any little adjustment or something problems. And I watched your, you know, 30 day MBA and talking about capacity, talking about how the, you know, the Walmart doesn't open up all those lines except a couple of times a year. Same with, you know, the, the grocery stores, but when they need them, they need them and restaurants, you know, it's empty most of the time, but they got to have enough room when they need it. And when I built another office, you know, we put seven ops in here and it has been so wonderful to have open chairs and things so that people can come in and, and I can do little things and we can work so many other people in and it's so much easier. It has actually lowered my stress level tremendously by having enough chairs 
And anyway, that was it. It's, it's the capacity thing. We, we don't always have five chairs full, but it's not terribly uncommon with a bunch of ortho kids or something. But we generally are working out of three and four chairs a lot. And that's that's become comfortable for me. But when I first started, it wouldn't be. It would have been, it would have been and, almost. And you'll go to any grocery store. They'll have 12 checkout lanes. And most of the time, there's only two open. But they know right. their cost. And right. they know their cost ain't checkout lanes. And when they get swamped, someone gets on the screen and say, I need all checkers to the front, all checkers to the front. And they run up, they man their stations, they work the flow. Same thing with uh, dirty rooms. Like sometimes you don't have time after you dismiss a patient to clean up the room. Right. You're running late, so you just leave a dirty room because you got other rooms. And then that right. room should, every room should be Southwest Airlines, a Boeing 737. You should be able to go into every single room, every single drawer. It's exactly the same thing. So if I'm in the hygiene room in most offices and I say, gosh, you just need a filling. You don't want to come back for a filling. And it's just a little right. bitty filling. You want me to do it right now? 99% of dental offices. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll have to move you out of this room because this is my room. And so what do you want me to do? Go set up another room, then get the patient up and move them to another room. We just lost 10, 15 minutes, a lot of disposable supplies. Why don't you hygienist go to another room? And she's like, well, Absolutely. because that room doesn't have a profi cup in drawer number three. We'll make every damn room the same. Could you imagine being sitting on a flight on Southwest Airlines? The pilot gets on the plane and says, extension all passengers, uh, all 120 of you have your luggage checked on. I just realized this is not my plane, and my plane in the drawer over here should have a ballpoint pen. So I'm going to ask everybody to get off the plane and uncheck your luggage and go three planes down because this room can't do a filling because it doesn't, you know, it's like it's just – operations, logistics, logistics, logistics. Sometimes these people have two or three extra rooms and they didn't even have time to clean them, but everybody uh, float on time. And another thing on patients' mentality, on their mental health, if you're running 15 minutes late and they're waiting in the waiting room for 15 minutes, they are pissed. But when you got extra rooms, you seat them on time and then you go numb them up on time. And then you say, Mrs. Jones, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd really like to do this so that you don't feel a thing. And I'm going to set a timer for 15 minutes. I want this to soak in so it doesn't <laughs> hurt. She's all happy. So pre-process right. weights piss her off and she might not ever come back. In process weights, she thinks she's that something's getting accomplished. People don't want to waste time. So if they think something is getting done... Uh, that they're gonna love it. Last and final question, man. We're we're two uh we're like two schoolgirls on the uh playground talking. We've gone over uh we've already gone over ten minutes. Uh, can I ask you one more question? Even though we got sure. over ten minutes, let's go. Um, final question: How do you keep people from stealing your services on the collection policy? How many times have you done a filling and then they get up front and they say, "You know what? Bill me," and then never pay. Well, yeah, uh, I learned that from you too, by the way, on some, where you, you, just like in the, the fast food business, you give the order, take the money, give the food. Okay. So what we have done is same scenario. We talk about it. Uh, the patient agrees. Okay. We're going to do this filling or this crown, but I certainly don't want to be doing the crown and guessing whether or not the patient is going to be paying me or not. Uh, we we're never getting that position anymore at the office. But the one thing I take it a little step further that some people think is kind of strange, but I think the most, the best time to collect is simply after you've discussed this, say the patient this morning that needed a root canal, um, they agree to do it. Everything's fine. Okay, that's fine. We've already talked about the bill. They agree. Well, then I get the patient numb and then I simply tell my assistant, you know, I tell them, I tell the patient, hey, now Karen's going to help you up front here to take care of some of your paperwork and your next appointment. So while this is working in, we're not wasting time. Well, then we simply escort the patient up to the front. They pay and then we seat them back down. And what I found is that that little time while you're getting them numb is very valuable because every once in a while you'll have someone trying to stiff you. And if they're really trying to steal from you, they're going to go up to the front. They're going to make a big scene and pay. That means they were trying to just to, to steal from me or they'll go up to the front and then suddenly say, well, I'll, I'll have to be back in a minute. I, I don't have it. So it sounds kind of strange to, to some, but I tend to numb first, let them pay. They get back in the chair and we start. 
Now that's that's a that's a little bit off what some people do. Sometimes we just have them pay beforehand. Obviously, if anyone owes anything um, when they come in, say we've got to see you know a bridge or something, and something they still owed on it for some reason, we have them pay that before they're seated. So um, anyway, I've had it, it works very well as long as it's not a something that appears rude or or uh, you know uncaring. And, and I, I, it's been really good. We, we don't have a problem with people. Obviously, we don't have a problem with people, you know, trying to steal our services. Anyone that does something like that and leaves because they were trying to steal from you, they go tell all their 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 scumbag buddies that, uh, hey, don't go over there. You'll get numb and he won't, nothing will happen. You know, and, and these are people that are trying to steal from you. What percent? You're in Texas, the Lone Star State. You're in a town of about what, five thousand? You said uh, about thirty-five thousand. Thirty-five. 30, thirty-five. Okay. Yeah. You're in a town of thirty-five thousand in the Lone Star State, about eighty miles north of Houston. You said, right, right. What percent of the people in your hood do you think are would intentionally try to not pay for it, steal your services? Oh gosh, um, it was more when I first started. I guess they wanted to take advantage of me when I was younger. But I would say it's very, it's well under 1%. It, you know, it might be well under a 0. 0.0 something percent. So it's not a lot. It's not a lot at all. But I mean, what, uh, what, what percent? What percent? You, you, you think it's under 1%? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I would say. Well, that's now when you're 55. But what about when you were opened up 30 years ago? Oh, yeah. When I opened up 30 years ago and I was much more gullible, I would do, I would overproduce and not collect. I would do the work and then sometimes people would simply say, bill me or I'll be but, back or but, that but, kind of thing. But out of 100 people, when you just started out, out of 100 oh, people, how many say, would you think would try to take advantage of you? Maybe three or four percent. Yeah, exactly. That's why I agree. So so the bottom line is, so the average overhead is, uh, according to the ADA, is two thirds. It's 65 percent. So let's say, I, I'd say it's about five. It's about one in 20 Americans. So if you right. do that 5%, well, you have two-thirds overhead. So you, that 5% you didn't collect costs you a dime to make. So 10% of your overhead is just the collection policy. And what I have convinced that, that 30 years, a couple things. One in 20 people have no intention of paying. And those are the only ones that scream and yell <laughs> about your collection policy and the old doctor never did right. that. And well, yeah, because they just don't want to pay. You can't go into a mall and get a wedding dress and not walk out and pay or get tennis shoes or, or you can't, you know, you, you can't go anywhere. You go into McDonald's and order a hamburger. The 16 year old high school still kid says, well, give me three bucks. You say, well, I don't have three bucks. Just give me a hamburger. I'm going to eat it. Then bill me. She'd laugh. But, right, the, but and right. who has this problem? It's the young dentist. And we're That's old different. dentists sharing our stories on these podcasts for free with these kids to ch- sit there. Don't learn lessons the hard ways. I mean, if you don't read books and autobiographies, you'll only live one life. If you read 100 biographies, uh, especially autobiographies, you'll live 100 lives. And the only people that complain about a collection policy are people who never wanted to pay you. And if I tell you you need a crown, uh, our office is really good at insurance, verification, all that. So we know we have a 99.8% collection policy. So we know what your insurance can do. But if we say your portion is 100 bucks, you know, you give us 100 bucks, and then we do it. They say, well, just do it and bill the insurance, and we'll see what they don't pay, and then, then bill me. No, we know what the insurance is going to pay. We do this all day, every day. Your portion's 100 bucks, and they say, well, why don't you get paid till Friday? Well, great. Let's go up front and find an appointment sometime next week Well, you got your paid. Well, no, I want to do it today. Well, we take a credit card. Uh, well, I don't have a credit card. Well, dude, they give every American a credit card application when they're prenatal. <laughs> I mean, if you look at those ultrasounds close enough, you can see that that – chase one card uh in their hand so if if chase (laughs) won't give you a credit card why the hell would i give you a credit card but i'm telling you young kids one out of 20 americans i can't speak for canada and mexico but one out of 20 americans um are trying to not pay and just like a lion when he sees a herd of gazelles well he ain't gonna go after the strongest fastest gazelle he looks for the old one he looks for the wounded one and then they, they try to separate that guy from the herd and kill it. And in dentistry, predators sit there and see that new dentist open. And they say, oh, she just graduated in 2017. <laughs> I'm going to go there. I mean, they are predatorily seeking you out 
So order hamburger, order cheeseburger, give me three bucks, I give you cheeseburger. Your collection should be 100%. David, you are so uh, damn cool. I love you to death. I feel like I uh, know everything about you. Uh, by the way, your avatar says that you signed up in 2000. That's because we didn't set the, when we started in 98, we didn't set the timer. So all <laughs> you old dogs, all you old dogs, I think it's like the first hundred or so, you all have the same Thanks, registration so. date. And whenever I see a guy like you with that registration date, that means you were already a member when we programmed in the timer. <laughs> gotcha. I gotcha. But we speak the same language, Howard, we do. I mean, uh, I, I was really impressed with what you did and then setting all this up and especially dental town. And I was trying to be a little encouraging, especially to the young dentist and those in dental school. There's a lot of negativity sometimes on dental town, but these kids, if they, if these, if they come out, make common sense choices, don't put yourself in debt, don't spend more than you make uh, just a few common sense things. They can do very well in this profession and it, it doesn't have to be such a grind. I, I, it's frightening to see some of the, stories on dental town and I, and I try to encourage some of those younger dentists in particular to hang in there it does get better things get uh you know how it is that the more you do it the easier it gets dentistry is a lot more fun for me than it was when i started it's just more enjoyable because there's less things that can fool me there's less things i know what i want to do i've gotten better with my staff i've gotten better with patients and so just over time things tend to get better and that's what I'd like to just uh, basically leave it on. And and kudos to you, man, because Dental Town's like the only AA meeting for dentists. It's the only place you can go <laughs> and say, "And hey, my name's Howard oh. Fran, and I, I am a dentist, and I and I'm right. stressed out because blah 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 blah." And it's guys like right. you that are Dental Town. I mean, you've posted nine thousand three hundred twenty-one times, and you have shared so much. I mean, every day. When people go to dental town, it's like you don't go to an AA meeting. What would an AA meeting be like if you went to the church and you're the only guy there? When they go right. there, they're expecting guys like you to be there. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for always being there for two decades. And and those are just your posts, all your private messages. But, I mean, when I think of dental town, and guys like you are just uh, so amazingly special. Thank you so much for not only all that you do for your patients and for dentistry, but thank you for all that you do for Dental Town. I appreciate it, Howard. Thank you so much. And you have a rocking hot day. You too. Have a good one.